Welcome to Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust, covering car culture and the automotive world with Shane Osborne, Brady Wright, and Steve, the producer, Johan. Let's see what's up this week. And here is what's happening Tuesday, February 18th, 2020, 2020. Brady Wright, Shane Osborne, Steve, the producer, Johan, joining our million point three listeners on this 125th episode of Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. You can find us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and, of course, Podomatic.com. Thank you for liking and following our Facebook page and just for being here in general because, you know, that's kind of why we do this. Our first segment is always Back to the Blacktop, and that is where Steve collects a uh, cornucopia of automotive <laughs> cornucopia. news. That's right, of uh, yes. automotive news and uh, various breadfruit, and he brings it out and lays it on the table, and we chop it to bits and eat it. So, what do you got this week? Well, I've got some really interesting stuff. Incredible, cool news coming from an LA-based uh, car maker. You probably heard of it, Divergent. Yes, and uh, they're all about. Uh, well, I'll tell you what they're about. Okay. Well, they will be showing off their latest creation at the upcoming Geneva Car convention which is going to be next week the car uh show owner zinger uh that's c but then it's zinger so owner zinger is promising to deliver a real zinger when it debuts <laughs> uh you like that uh the 21c hypercar next week the california startup claims its new model will deliver 1250 horsepower using a strong hybrid drivetrain enough to launch the tandem two-seater from 0 to 100 kilometers at 62 miles per hour in a mere 1.9 seconds. Only a handful of vehicles have ever broken the 2-second two two barrier, including the Rimac C2. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. They, 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 they basically are out of L.A. This is like basically one year after they launched um, their, their company last year, and they're really heavily into doing... 3D printing, using composites and that kind of thing. And I actually got onto their website today and sent a little message and said, we want to interview the owner of this company. So we will see. I know that he's going to be off getting ready to uh, do a show next week. But, hey. It'll be a while before we can get to him. But nevertheless, that would be cool. It would be really cool. Um, link the website uh, on our page, of course. Okay. Uh, Steve will be doing that. And we'll get a chance to take a look at the thing. The picture of the car is very cool. It's slick and Nifty and you know swoopy and all. Well, those it's things definitely a supercar. Yeah, There's no yeah. doubt about it. But they'll can do the complete reveal next week, so we can yeah. post it. You know how they kind of keep things in a. Oh sure. Everything's a little shrouded. They'll cover it with camo. Oh yes, they do. Well, that <laughs> was, you know how long, how many months we watched the, the the Corvette go on pictures, and it was always oh, in the sure. camo and everything. Yes, yes. And they're doing the same thing with the bla- uh the Bronco and. A all buddy that of mine is thing. buying one of the mid-engine Corvettes. Whoa! He's cool. well. He's he. Uh, you know him. Yeah. Um, he's the guy with the Hellcat, uh, and he's had fun with the Hellcat. But the Hellcat got in an accident. Somebody Ooh. hit it, and oh. it's being fixed. But the thing is, once he's he's one of those guys where once the thing has been hit, it's never the same for him. So he's got to get rid of it. Okay. So he now he's going to buy the mid uh, the C what is it C eight. I think that's yep. what it is. Yeah, so he's uh, he'll be quite thrilled with it. If he didn't live in Phoenix, <laughs> I would go over and make him let me drive it. But yes, uh, at very least, um, we'll well, and a, down a there you can it. have the top down and to do the whole thing. It'll be great. Yeah, for him. no doubt. So, well, Toyota is announcing it will be adding all-wheel drive to a number of its sedans to bring them in line with their SUVs as demand for all-wheel drives have spiked this past two years. It will be adding all-wheel drive options on models such as the Camry, Avalon, and Prius. And so the fact is they're kind of following what Subaru has done forever. And I guess, you know, maybe it means that we are heading, maybe they know something we don't know, Brady. They Maybe we're heading into more snowier weather the, in colder climates now. <laughs> Um, you know, we keep <laughs> hearing about things, but just it, about anybody would know stuff we don't know, but that's okay. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. But yeah. apparently, maybe the maybe the collective conscience of 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 the human race here in 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 the Western Hemisphere is we like SUVs. Maybe there are, we're all thinking that something's going to happen. That's they need more snow. So it's the vehicle of choice for the apocalypse. Is that yes, what you're I think that's what it I, is. Uh, sure, <laughs> why, why not? I don't course. know, but wh- why else is SUV so popular? I just don't understand it. But it's anyway, because Jeeps are out of style. <laughs> 
There well, was an ad on Facebook. I swear to you, I, I'm going to tell you this true. There was an ad on Facebook for a company in the Philippines that is making. You know, remember the Jeep, the World War the II real Jeep? Jeeps? Yeah. Well, Jeep in a box. Yep. They, they shipped them. That was the way they shipped them to the to the front lines. So these guys in the Philippines are making <laughs> these things now, and you can get the civilian model, the military model, and then some you know oh, off road thing. I could not find a price. I I combed their website wow. because the pictures. It's a Jeep in a box, just like right. everyone you ever saw. And it, I'm sure it's not cheap, but that's not no. the point. It's just one, you know, you could actually get one of these what things. What if it's going to come with a four-cylinder? Because that's what they it does. had. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it's totally exactly what the Jeeps yep. were. Yep, yep. Um, but it's manufactured new, of course, uh, and ma- again, manufactured in the Philippines. I will try to find a price for okay. it. I combed through the website and I couldn't get it. But uh, they'll ship it, you know. Well, speaking of Philippines, here in America, General Motors has decided to accelerate its global retrenchment yes. by shutting down its Australian brand Holden. Oh, I know. And I pulling know. the Chevrolet brand out of Thailand and selling its manufacturing complex there to China's Great Wall Motors. Yeah. Well, you know, if 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 you know anything about Holden, it was famous. It was their it was, it was their Australian it GM. It was Australian GM. Or Australian GM. And basically, if yeah. you watch any of the movies from back in the day, Mad Max featured some of them. Well, sure. Uh, well, every I mean, the Holdens are all Holdens over Holdens were all over the place. Yeah. In fact, their concept car from about 6 years ago is still a gorgeous piece it of is. work. It is. And it's just you know they they are iconic. It's be it's the equivalent of shutting down Chrysler. It is. You know, or well, I guess shutting down Buick. Yep. Um and yeah, people there are losing their jobs. It's it's not a pretty thing, and it's 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 a loss for the car world in general. But it it's is. a loss for Australia for sure. It's another brand. It's another loss. Um, yeah. And then, uh, speaking of, um, well, maybe not losses, but uh, gains. We talked a week ago about Harley Davidson branding the GMC truck. Well, of course, now they've just announced it with the Tuscany Motor Company, which is their partner in all this. Of course, they're coming out with the all-brand-new uh, F-250 Ford edition of the Harley-Davidson uh, truck. Yes, of course. So well, they've, Ford what's is, left is they got to figure out a way to do Ram. Uh, I, think I, Ram I think Ram needs to go and partner up with Indian because that might be a really cool combo. <laughs> that would really tick them off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, this whole idea of, I mean, I, I get it. It's a nice truck. It's a good pr- partnership. I, I understand what they're doing. But the whole idea of I'm going to spend another $4,000 just to have somebody else's right. logo on my truck. Yeah. I'm advertising for them and paying for the privilege. I don't know. I'm with you. Maybe. I, I, I mean, brand loyalty is brand loyalty. And right. certainly Harley Davidson has nothing but brand loyalty over the decades. But. But I, um, yeah, I, I got. If you're going to go that way, go down to Shelby America and get a Raptor for your Ford. I mean, well, I guess, but it's not quite the same. I but mean, you know what I'm saying with a with a, a Raptor. That's the super hot package. For yeah, the yeah, Ford but it, but it's but it's a Ford that's got a you know a hop up package. Yes. On it. this is no different from any other I Ford know. or it, Chevy exactly. truck. There's it's no, just got a bunch of logos all over. That's it. right. you Do you remember bug boards, beetle boards? Back in the 70s, eh, probably the 80s, they, they would paint your Volkswagen for six months and then repaint it when it was done. But they ba- basically would paint it with the logo of some product, some thing, 7-Up, Coca-Cola, Camel oh, cigarettes. Right. That you, you'd, and you'd drive your car around with this paint job Oh, yeah, on those, it. those. well, you could get wraps. Yes. It wasn't a wrap. It was a paint job. That was, was the paint. This was before wraps. Okay. But they, but they would paint your car. And then six months later, after you had advertised for them wherever you went, then they would repaint your car, which, you know, was part of the package. Um, but essentially, you got your car painted after you drove around an advertisement for whatever the product was right. for six months. Some people thought that was cool and did it, and I'm, yep. I'm making a judgment, but it's kind of the same. You're paying extra. Maybe you can go case. with a Heinz, like a Heinz ketchup or but a it, Hershey's but, chocolate but bar version. But you see version. what it is. I see You're exactly paying what extra it is. to yeah, advertise somebody. I, I don't know. They should pay you. See, that's at least with the Beetle boards, you got your car painted out of the deal. Yes, that's right. And, and it didn't cost you anything. And me being in the promotional products business, um, you hand somebody a nice free shirt with your name on it. Or something. You, or something. But yeah. you're not telling them, I want you to buy that. All the <laughs> well, spo- well, the sports companies yeah. have done that, though. Oh, yeah, of course. So, oh, of course. Anyway, so... Hey, thanks for a, tuning in. Yes. we got a whole bunch more cool stuff coming up. Uh, we actually are going to talk to Jerry Heasley, the barn find guy. We talked with him before, and he's coming up next on Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust.
Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Donnie Smith. You've been listening to Horse Park, Chrome, and Rush. Uh, enjoy yourself. Hi, it's Jeff Conwell with the Monsters and Manson. Giving a big shout out to everyone at Horsepower, Chrome and Rust. My mind's out of gear and my heart's in overdrive. I've everything to fear. I ain't never been more Horsepower, Chrome and Rust is back with the first half of the Windshield View. And this week we're talking with a guy who loves the lure of barn finds. Welcome, Jerry Heasley, back to the show. <laughs> hey. How you doing Glad out to there? Be here. Yeah, good. Glad to have you. We had a lot of fun last time. I went out and started looking around for barns, but I couldn't find any. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think that we're was all the... over Ohio. I <laughs> went back from Ohio and did a great one, man. Did you? Yeah. Well, let's Shelby, just just so that we said. just so we can get everybody kind of built back up to speed here, because it's not everybody may have heard the first segment we did with you. Tell us what what got you interested in doing this in the first place. Well, way back in. About 1989, 1990, I saw Shelby, the first Shelby race car come into the uh, Cobra show in Dallas, and people were crowded around this thing, and it was it was just an old Hulk, and I thought, what what is that? Why are people crowding around it? Well, Mark Gillette had just brought that thing in from Mexico, and uh, <laughs> it was a barn find, a rare find, or whatever, and and I called my editor and I said, "Hey, I was real excited. You know, you didn't have a cell phone in those days. You would. That's right. I, I'd get on a pay phone, <laughs> and then I. You always I'd, carried I'd a quarter a around with number. you. Well, <laughs> you, you call a certain number. You call sure. an eight hundred number, yeah. and you you punch in your code. And so I get Tom Borkman on the phone, and, and I told him about this car, and I wanted to do a story on it. And he said, "Yeah, great, great. You know, after it's restored." And I go, no, I'm not waiting years right now. <laughs> yeah, that's not the point. Crowd around it, but but they didn't understand that at that time. Yeah. So we just had to ditch it, and he he wouldn't take it. And uh, that's been kind of the story of my career, doing stuff like that, uh, because I feel like I come I come from the general interest market magazines I work for, and and uh, you get into the car field, and you've got you know car people. Uh, you wonder if your editor's a car person or an editor or, or what. More, sure. More swayed towards cars. Uh, he's there because he loves cars or what. But anyway. Well, well it's man, funny that's that. That's how I got started. Well, you know, it's, it's funny that, uh, like you say, so a lot of people back in the day, and I mean, I go back that far and farther, and, and people would find stuff, you know, out in the weeds, and they had no idea at the time, it was before all these shows where everybody's, you know, a picker and all these, you know, this stuff that you know, they've inflated the value on everything, and I don't bother me, I know what I have. Well, back in the day, people sometimes didn't. Sometimes they just had something laying in the in the back shed or something. And the thrill of finding something that was, you know, either rare or unusual or just kind of cool um, that was what sort of drove a lot of people to do that whole barn fight. And now, I mean, it seems like it's almost a, a, a manufactured deal. And, of course, with shows like, you know, Meekum and uh, Barrett-Jackson, they're getting ridiculous money for some of these things, and in some cases, deservedly so. But I don't think the thrill of finding something out there that, you know, maybe nobody else has seen ever goes away. Yeah, well, that's true. And you talk about things bringing a lot of money you know barn finds you're really selling the dream because a lot thank of those you. cars thank you exactly are really right. expensive to fix yes oh so. yes <laughs> well and speaking of of barn finds they uh about a, about two weeks ago maybe three weeks ago the original bullet mustang went up for auction i think 3.4 3.7 million dollars for the original bullet mustang and it looked just like it did when they pulled it off the uh, the the studio lot. It was rusted and it was beat up and it looked it was just the the thing. And the, it was the second owner ever, and they finally needed to make some money, I guess, and they sold it. So um, you you get these rare rare cars out there, but the, the the average person will never come into contact with a rare car. But Jerry, you you focused you started writing about this, and really you were the ones that kind of start the whole trend. And then out of that, you, you started your own YouTube channel. You've, you've self-taught yourself how to use a camera, how to do the editing. And you decided to, to, to really start the trend in this arena. Now there's a, been a tremendous amount of new other 
<clears throat> well-known and not so well-known individuals doing the similar thing as you. But talk to us about the whole aspect of, did you know where some of these were when you began doing your videoing, or did you just kind of go out and hunt and peck for them in the first place? Well, I started the call them. I was in El Paso working for Popular Hot Rodding, doing tech articles at MSD. And I met Michael Lightborn there, who uh, was telling me about a Boss 429 in Juarez that was being used as a doghouse. And hmm. I said, I want to do that story. There you okay. go. So that was the first story. That was the first for her finds. And I got Jerry Pitt at, uh, at Hot Rod to uh, bite on, on a column. Nobody else would do it. I uh, That was later. I, and, and, but at Popular Hot Rodding, I got Pete Pistero to let me do a story on uh, barn finds in um, uh, El Paso and Juarez. And then later, Jerry Pitt bought the story for Hot Rod Mustang, and I expanded it to four magazines. And um, that's, uh, you know, now 28 years later, I did <laughs> almost a 1,000 of those. Eventually, you, you kind of always fi- get the readers credit, you know. For, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lead me to stuff. Well, and sometimes you know people will find an interest in something that you thought, hey, this is going to be a one or a two article deal, and everybody's like, no, no, do more of these. This is this is kind of cool. Oh yeah, I, uh, it's fun, and there's all sorts of different ones right now that that people that aren't in the know don't don't even know what I'm talking about. I, I don't want to give away, but we've got some. I've got some really exciting stuff coming out now. Uh, in Ohio, uh, I was there a uh, week before last, and we went out. In, it's not one day. We had an ice storm the day we went out and got the car, but it was time. I mean, my friend up there that I've done many rare finds with because he has a shop, so he gets calls. And um, so I urge people, give me a call if you know where one is. These days, I don't like to do them unless I go along when the car is um, found and it looks like, you know, in its untouched state. I always tell people, don't touch them. Let us get there. The car's worth more money if you don't touch it. Sure. And you let us photograph it and document it. And that's what I'm doing. It gives it a provenance and it gives them the excitement if it's been sitting there a long time. And, you know, they don't have to be dusty old cars either. Sometimes we find cars that are just like new that have been sitting with hardly any miles on them. And those are also interesting. So, and, and, and there's parts, I mean, <laughs> I could tell you stories. Uh, I mean, a guy was in Georgia and the guy told me, he said, well, he went in this guy's uh, uh, barn there and had a bunch of cars and he had some parts back there and found a trunk mat, you know, and, and I, I put this in one of my uh, barn find videos, the last one, the 67 GT500 we did in Iowa. I uh, put it up January the 7th, and it hit $5 million in um, 27 days. So <laughs> that's it's a really a nice. Yeah, I, that's my best one. I've had them hit $4 million and $2, 3000000 million, but this was the best. And it, it's, it's really a, a fun find. And so I, I'm just getting better at editing them and, putting in there what people want to see. And so you, you've got a strong lead on it, but you've also got quality content. That was a 22-minute video. And and I hate to call them videos because video to me is just somebody did a video and put up. Sure. These are really <clears throat> documentaries. These are movies because uh, that was 100 hours of editing work. And yeah. most people don't want to do that. But it's 100 hours, and I had many hours that I had, uh, you know, video to get – that content, and then also photos, and um, well, so and I think people don't. Re- I think people don't realize how much work goes into making something like that. You know, a successful presentation or documentary or video or whatever you want to call it. Um, it there's a lot of stuff that gets left on the cutting room floor, if you will. Um, that you know that goes towards finding those you know, those 22 minutes worth of great stuff. And actually, I'd like to ask you about that. It, over the years, obviously, you get a feel for what's going what's gonna to work and what's not going to work and, and how to really do a presentation that's, you know, that's, what am I trying to say, worth the car. Um, well, I'm going to have to butt well, I was going to say, we're, we're going we're to take a break, and I, w- I want to talk about that when we come back. Yeah, okay. so hang on there, Jerry. We've got more of uh, our show. 
on Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. We'll be right back. More Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust after these messages. This is Jerry Heasley, and you're listening to Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust, the greatest show I've been on in uh, at least the last year. Back in Vehicle City. And back with the second half of the Windshield View. Steve Johan and Brady right here at uh, Horsepower Chrome and Rust. Barn finds continue with Jerry Heasley, the barn find guru. And uh, just before the break, we were talking about how, Jerry, how, how you kind of find, you know, the right piece, the right car, the right presentation, you know, for, uh, for doing some of these documentaries that you do. And I'm really interested in, in if you go back, how did you know, for example, you probably could pick two or three that you knew were going to really work and, and maybe a couple that you weren't sure, but turned out to be pretty good. What, what is it that tells you this is, this is the way to do this? Well, I think first you've got to have something that is quality. You've got to have a quality, real deal. You can't make stuff up. We just don't make stuff up. Sure. And and uh, then when I produced the video or the movie, uh, I have the storyline. I have to follow the storyline that I find. It's a real storyline, but it's one that will be something that kind of quenches the thirst of, of the people viewing it. In other words, oh, they want to see what happens. And so... There's different storylines. When I get there, I find out what it is. Sure. And and you talk about the, quenching a thirst, yeah. but also creating one. I mean, people want to, you know, you, you start a, a video like that, they want to see the whole thing. you gotta, you got to make them, you know, interested enough in what you're doing to want to follow it all the way through, too. Yes, you do. And in, in my videos, uh, they cost quite a bit of money to make. You know, I had uh, about uh, 4001 that $4,000 uh, in one of my videos, and most of them I get, you know, a thousand, two thousand in them, and so some of them don't don't make anything, but some of them do pretty well. Sure. And and that's that's part of it too. You you have to go ahead and 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 just um, you know you got to be committed. You got to be all in. You know, so, I'm all in to get this stuff right. Give me. I, I know that. Uh, I mean, we're going to link this to uh, our site, of course, too. But um, just so that, since we're talking about your videos and how and how cool they are, where can people find them? Well, you just go to YouTube, and I just put my name up. I don't have any branding or anything, and I have people criticize me for it, like, <laughs> "Well, where's your introduction?" They want them, and I said, "Look, to me." People just want the story. They just want to get into it. So it's just my name, Jerry Heasley. And, um, it, you know, there you'll, you'll get my channel. I think we're going to we're gonna link a couple of them for sure. Or, or, huh? Uh, we're going to link yeah. a couple of them to the show here for sure. Um, but, yeah, y y I mean, I do have your channel on my on my YouTube <laughs> page. I've got it saved, so I know where you are. But and, and Jerry, it's important I wanted to, to know. step back and kind of like what um, Brady was saying earlier. Um, you kind of alluded to that, that each – because some shows, they, they prep everything up, they get it all ready, and then they make it look like it's a big surprise and da-da-da-da. What you've done is you've already been contacted by the owner, I take it, so you've got permission to come out on their property, so it's not like you're just stumbling in off the street. But from that point on, you pretty much look at, you show up, and you start kind of allowing the lay of the land, the lay of the person. Kind of walk us through that, because i got to imagine that each person's a different, unique individual. There's a different, unique story behind these vehicles, how they got there, why they're still there. And that's where your story really begins, isn't it? Yes, I talked to them. I talked to one uh, couple with a 67 SS Camaro, and I we talked for two hours before we started filming. Number one, it makes them comfortable. Number two, I want to find out what the story is so that I can film it that way um, and, and get what's interesting out there. You know, I worked uh, before... Uh, automobile magazines. I worked for the National Choir and a lot of 
a lot of big magazines, but like the Inquirer would fly me into Lantana, and they would I would go there and work for a week, and they'd hand me stories to do. I'd turn them in, and, and my editor, you turn them in, my editor would look and say, no, 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 we got to have a stronger lead. That's that's not good. And so I'd have to change it. So, you know, I was already a really good writer because I was one of the top ones in the country sure. But for, for this big magazine, but they honed that skill. And um, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm finding out what's really interesting, okay, because people don't want to be educated. They want to be entertained. Yes. But, you know, you can also educate them. You know, this last video, I was really surprised. We had Jeff Yerkovich on, and he is a real Shelby expert. He's restored probably more Shelbys than anybody in the country. And so he went to, with us. Well, I went with him because he found this car. So he calls me, hey, you know, they, they know I've written the column for years, and this is what I'm doing. Otherwise, I would not be in. You know, I've done it 28 years. I know all these people. They're friends of mine. And I'm on the West Coast, and Jeff calls up, and he says, hey, can you get out here? And I, I've been, this is my second city. I was tired, you know. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, okay. Well, the next morning, I, I thought, man, I was going to take today off. I, I just I was flying home, and now I'm going to have to rush to the airport. And I call him. I said, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. And he said, okay. And then I hung up the phone, and I saw the picture. He said, I thought, man, you, you got to just you got to just throw everything in the suitcase and head to the airport. That's all you got to. So I called him back. He said, look, I'll, I'll be there. I'm leaving it at noon. Pick me up to the airport at 5. And so he picks up the airport, and we head out in the morning to Des Moines from Kansas City. And uh, it was it was a fun day, and, and I'm certainly glad I, I just couldn't miss that. And so that, that happens. You, know, you just have to pick up and fly, you know what I mean? Well, you got to go where I've the got, story is, I'm sure. Yeah, you got to go where the story is, but the airfare was a thousand dollars, see, <laughs> because it was short notice. It was sure. like six hundred and something out there, and five hundred to get over back home. And oh, so yeah. I'm spending eleven hundred dollars, and right away. And so, uh, but but I I feel like I'm at the point now I can that yeah I, I'm, I'm I don't care I've got a passion for this you know what I mean so I'm going to do it. And and from now on, all my rare finds, uh, I want to be there. I, I don't want to call them rare finds. You know, barn finds is what I started out, and they said, you know, they said, well, what if it's not found in a barn? I said, it's a generic <laughs> term, but they didn't understand it in 1990. Yeah. So, you know. That's, well, since you, I mean, since you're is. talking about finds, and st- certainly, you know, Lord knows you've done a, a, a ton of them, um, give me just a second of probably two or three favorites, the ones that really stand out for you. You mean on video or, or since I started in, in 28 years ago? Oh, let's play. Let's mm-hmm. let's go since you started. Well, you know, the one that one comes to my mind is a guy found a 55 Ferrari race car out on the ranch in Texas. So you got to <laughs> love that. Body 55. Yeah. And, you know, that was incredible uh, find. Uh, I could go into detail, but I'll. Sure. Let, let me see some other ones. I, I tell you, tell you some other ones now. Uh, the most exciting find was the one I was in on, where my friends at the Lubbock Mustang Club said, "We well, are always doing things for people and buying them cars and coming down here and putting this in the magazine." We said, "We didn't know you like Porsches," and I said, "Yeah, I like Porsches." Yeah. And they said, "Well, there's a, there's a 911 down here with like no miles on it. It's a 91 model." And see, those are my numbers. Okay, so. I uh, 91. So I go down and look at the car, and I could I didn't get it bought the first time, but I did the second. And thanks to my friend Jeff Kruger, but we we go in there and I'm seeing all these nines and ones come up. So this is right, you know. I mean, this last trip I knew was right because <laughs> the, I was in room one one one, okay, one eleven, and and my rental car was in spot eleven. <laughs> so I thought, man, this is going to work. It's fate. Well, I go to buy this 911. See, I have a degree in math. I'm always, uh, numbers are my thing. So I, there you go. <laughs> I go there on August the 9th. That's when I, I left town on the 11th. I, I bought this car. It, it was my, my street address at home is 1919. It was on 19th Avenue. It had been <laughs> sitting there 19 years. It, it was a 1991 911. So still all those, and I finally got it home from Lubbock on 
and put it in the shop. It went in to Tampa Foreign Car Service on uh, September the 11th. I swear <laughs> to God, yes. I still got, I got to forget the bill. And then he didn't, I didn't get it out. He, he called me one day, this is 2013. He calls me. He said, well, your car's ready and come get it. And that was November the 9th. And <laughs> everything was, and, yeah. You're and killing I, me. You're, you're killing, it's a kismet here. <laughs> <laughs> I was noticing this early, you know, on, yeah. <laughs> in Lubbock, I, I was seeing all these numbers come up. Well, I get my hotel room and I'm always anxious to see what my hotel number is. And so they gave me room 121 and I thought, gee, there's no. There's no uh, nines or ones there. And I thought, well, you've got a two inside of two ones on either side. There's your 11. But then it dawned on me. I got to my room. I said, wait a minute. The square root of 121 is 11. There you go. There you go. See, <laughs> you know? see, that's why a degree in math is better than an uh, interest in numerology. <laughs> you, <Yeah. laughs> you, well, yeah. you could actually make that work. <laughs> it was that's, working out for me. You know, it was a great, great day. It was fun. It was exciting. So there's. The most exciting ones when you get the rare finds, you know, and it's your sure. dream car. Oh yeah. And I almost screwed it up though. You know, I'm not very good at. You got to know how to talk to these people to get the car. And and if it's an enthusiast, if you love the car, oh, they're so happy. Okay. Oh my God, my baby's going to home. Okay. Now, if you're just like a used car flipper type guy, right? And you tell them, oh, I just love this car. Well, they raise the price. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how bad did you want that before you got here, and how bad do you want it now? Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you, I could tell you stories. I mean, this is, I could go on all night. Just well, we about got time. <laughs> well, <laughs> you were, well, my, I could, but, you know, but I, I rarely get a car. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to get them, but. I love to help people get cars too, and I, I've never charged anybody. Everybody wants a, a fee or something. I, hey, you want a car? I mean, here, you know, let me go film it. I mean, I mean, I never like when when people. It's funny because people know me from the magazine. They call me up there, Frank, with me. They always they'll tell me what they pay for cars, mm -hmm. but I won't tell anybody. And I said, "Would well, you want, want me to put this in?" The, and so, most of them say no, but sure. I've started. I've started getting people warmed up to saying how much they paid. You know, and, and yep. uh, people want to know. But um, well, uh, you, know. you know, that's that's if you can get people to talk about what they did pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. the the uh, speaking of paying the the original uh, Mustang used for Bullet was paid was sold for thirty five hundred. Sold again for thirty five hundred, and that's what the last owner bought it for was thirty five hundred. And now thirty five years later, they're selling it for three point five million dollars. Well, there's threes in all of there, so maybe there's that's yes, that's right. <laughs> um, but th the fact is, people hey. people love to hear these kind of numbers because they're like, no way. I mean, it just makes your top blow. I mean, when you when you when you hear this, but then people have to remember what times were like when they bought the car, and it wasn't like what we have today so you you adding that into your show i think is very intriguing and people want to know this because it gives them a perspective yeah well but you know sometimes they got it a little cheap and they don't want anybody to know so oh yeah them. i'm doing one now where i'm asking them to <laughs> look at the car and they just told me it was an Oldsmobile Hearst 68 and they said, well, they just wanted to flip it. And, you know, I said, okay. Um, but they told uh, the person they buy it, I said, well, what do you, they said, well, we just want to buy it and flip it. <laughs> I love that because, you know, sure. okay, they want to flip it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, nope. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people I mean, buy cars for an investment. That's not, that's not unheard of. But what is, what is, uh, the situation when, like, I know a guy told me one time, he said, well, he said, he said, I was getting a haircut, and I guess his barber had a, a, a I remember it's a Challenger or a Cuda, but uh, it didn't have an engine in it. And so he wanted to sell it. Well, they went and checked and looked at it, and it was a J-code. Hmm. Well, you know what that is. Sure. That, that's a Hemi. Yeah. And so, now here's the question. Do you tell, do you go to your barber and say, hey, man, uh, uh, that was a Hemi car, or, 
Or do you just say, oh, you want $1,100? I'll take it. <laughs> I mean, this has been a long time ago. I think he bought it really cheap. But is that, um, you know, do you think that's... Uh, I think, you know, question, according to Hoyle, ethics, basically. Is that ethic, ethic, yeah. ethics the word I put? Is yeah. that ethical? Yeah, that's a question. Or, that, that is that a good is, question. We were not we're not going to sit here and tell you the answer because there, there may not be an answer. You know, I know it's, it, it, it's what's called situational ethics. Yeah, sometimes it's the thing to do, and and I don't you know. I think sometimes people just want to get rid of something. And let's put it this way: if that was the case, the guy didn't have an engine in it, so you it wasn't like they actually had the Hemi sitting in there. So, but speaking of sitting there, we have about thirty seconds left of oh. our show, so. Um, mm. Well, Jerry, definitely. I mean, we appreciate having you back. It's always fun to talk with you, and uh, we are going to link your uh, YouTube channel to the uh, to the page so that people can kind of go there and come. I'm sure you have plenty of that. But Jerry Heasley, thanks a lot for stepping in and, and talking with us again this week. Oh yeah, it's it's really a lot of fun. I like you guys calling me anytime. All right. Well, hey, you are listening to the greatest automotive info show in the known world. A cool hot rod story you can tell your friends is up next. This is Horsepower Chrome and Rust. Stick around. We'll be back after these words. This is Quentin Folk. I dig up old hot rods, and I also dig this podcast. Hi, this is Adam Kramer from Avance.com. You're listening to Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. It's time for Cars Confidential, and we're back with a story from Lance Lambert this week. So what story do we have this week, Brady? Uh, well, actually, I have a cool story, but I want to say the line from that that bumper music. Right. My Spit motor's gasoline. clean. No, 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 no. My motor's clean spits gasoline. That's mutually exclusive. That's not the same thing. If right. your motor is clean, it's not spitting anything. Actually, I don't understand out why. the tailpipe. No, it's not supposed to spit gasoline out the tailpipe. Nobody will. Maybe the gasoline keeps the engine clean. No, you burn <laughs> the gasoline. We, this is this is basic mechanics 101. I want to talk to who wrote that song. That's oh, all I'm saying. Well, it's somebody that doesn't drive cars. <laughs> in the cars. Or, or understand. But it's a great song. It rhymed. It, it's it rhymed. A great, That's what it was. Yes, exactly. Make a rhyme. And if you listen to the whole song, it's about a ex-boyfriend. That's even weirder. But that's okay, because no, we deal in weird here. We are, uh, we have the uh, like corner Like a ball and chain. Come on, you know, Okay, like, then. Hey, yeah. so uh, uh, once again, Lance is, uh, <laughs> has given us permission to read a story out of uh, Confessions of a Car Guy, Fenders, Fins, and Friends. And this one, oh my gosh, this one has a picture of a, um, of a Nash Rambler in it. A but, Nash Rambler? Well, I, I'll tell you what's going on here in a minute. This is, uh, the title of the story is Bad Mechanic worse liar oh and it goes like this at the age of 19 i was the proud owner of a 1962 rambler classic four-door sedan it was pristine great body paint and interior one problem it ran terribly <laughs> it ran when i brought it in does any of his cars really run that good? In the Actually, beginning? the Avanti runs real nice, except but it was... We're talking back in the day. Blowing oil for a while, but we're he fixed talking that. talking back in the day. Well, it ran when I bought it, but in my 19-year-old wisdom, I decided to rebuild the engine. See, herein lies the problem. The key word here is I, I being me, had absolutely no experience in such matters. Oh, I was great at hanging out at my friends' garages and sharing my vast automotive wisdom with them, but when it came to actual hands-on mechanical work, I was uh, well, less than mechanically skilled. Uh, my every attempt at fixing cars resulted in compounding whatever the problem was that I was attempting to fix. I know guys like this. <laughs> yes. I got far enough into the Rambler engine rebuild to end up with parts everywhere and an engine that was nearly unfixable. See, this is the key. You're really good at taking it apart. You have no idea what to do at that point. Yes. Is the, the bench and the floor is covered yes. with stuff, and it's like, now what? So I boxed up all the parts, I tossed them into the trunk and back seat, so much for the great interior, and I called a tow truck and had the car taken to the cheapest garage I could find. Here's here's where the story starts to go sideways. <laughs> there was a reason that the garage was cheap. 
They were about as good at fixing cars as I was. They did get it running. Barely. It was time to sell this jewel. <laughs> I put an ad in the paper, and I got a call from a young woman looking for a reliable car. Well, yes, ma'am. It runs great. Wait a minute. That was a Titanic-sized lie that I told this this trusting lady. I decided that I was desperate, and I had to sell the car. So lie or no lie, she came to look at the car and agreed to purchase it. And as she was handing me the money, I heard a little voice telling me what a rotten guy I was. I just couldn't do it. I looked at her. I said, you know, this car runs terribly and I can't sell it to you. Rather than get mad, she thanked me sincerely and, and said how grateful she was that I had told her the truth. Granted, I was a bit late with the truth, but it did finally come out. Well, she left me there with a car that was going to be very hard to sell. However, good deeds don't go unrewarded. The next day, I got a call from a guy interested in the Rambler. He asked about the condition of the body and the interior. I explained that they were in excellent condition, but not wanting to repeat the previous day's experience, I told him that the motor was shot and the back seat needed a good cleaning. <laughs> he told me he also owned a 62 Rambler, and he had just rebuilt the engine. His son had wrecked the car, so he was looking for a great body to drop his rebuilt Perfect. motor into. Hallelujah! Yes. The sky opens up. He came by the next day and cautiously drove my old uh, and his new Rambler away. Things have not changed much. I'm still driving an old Rambler, but this 58 Rambler American has a rebuilt, high-performance, 327 cubic inch V8 Chevrolet motor in it that runs just great. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture of Lance's Rambler, although when he wrote this book, he had it. I'm not positive that he, he still has it this anymore. car. I think he may have no. flogged it for something else. But, you know, it, it, Lance's stories are, I, I give him full marks. I mean, they're great stories. He's a good writer and he's a good storyteller. Uh, but they're also kind of everyman stories. You know, it's almost impossible to read one of those stories or, or, you know, speak it aloud and not go, you know, that reminds me of. And then you're off, you know, then then you're off galloping through one memory of your own. And who among us has not <laughs> in the learning stages? Nobody comes out with an encyclopedic knowledge of no. automotive no. mechanics. It's a learned skill. And not everybody has the same level of skill. I mean, I could, you know, Shane is a master mechanic. There's yes. no other way to do it. Yep. And he's really good at stuff that I can't do. Right. Um, and so when he comes over to the house and, you know, we're working on something or another, I love the fact that he's one of those guys, and we, I know we have listeners who can do this. They look at it and go, all right, I already see everything that's wrong with this and what it'll take to fix it and how long it'll take and what you need and the fact that your tools are going to be okay for this job, except you need one. Yep. And this is like three seconds worth of brain power. And he turns or goes, says, have you got an impact wrench? Yes, I do. <laughs> I've never used it, but I have one. And yes. so, you know, it's stuff like that, that eventually you get better. And as long as your ego is such that you can say, I know where my skill level stops. And this is the place where I need help before you do a Lance and end up with parts all over your garage and the back seat of your car. It's and sometimes that's fun, too. Yes. It's part of the experience. It is. Like, I mean, I I can tell you, I learned very, very early on how to take apart a four cylinder British motor and put it back together. Not because I wanted to, but because I messed it up the first three times. But by oh, the fourth yes. time, I knew what I was doing. OK, so, you know, those are well, they're expensive I, lessons, but they stay with you. And every time my son goes to work on his car. And he has to fix something because it didn't work the first time around. Right, and we, right. I go, you know, I, I go, uh, Noah, by the third time you've done this, you can go really fast. Yes. Because once you've done it <laughs> once, it, you, it second, okay. Mm -hmm. By the third time, you know where everything is. You can whip that thing out. It, it, it is like clockwork. That's why when you go into the 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 place, the, part, the guys that fix your cars, they have time things. It tells them exactly right. how long it goes. Right. Well, um, I, I remember my El Camino when I was driving it. Uh, I went through some starters on there. It got to the point for, I think it took me five minutes to just take the starter off, put a new starter on. I mean, it sure. was that fast because I knew where it was. Having done it so many times. Oh, my gosh. Plus, you have, to, you have to remember there's a powerful motivator in anger and frustration. Oh, like if you, I don't want to do this again, but dang it, I and have to. And I thought to. that was a yeah. rebuilt motor that they gave me. Yes. Well, it's not. <laughs> it, it, it needed fixing. Yes. But uh, speaking of rebuilt motors and stuff, I just came across this very interesting thing about um, German auto maker employment according to a couple posts the german yes. auto industry known for its well-engineered car sustains uh which sustains hundreds of thousands of jobs in the automotive world 
Well, things may be changing because everybody is going, the German automakers are transitioning, transitioning, yes, that's the word, transitioning into electric vehicles, BMW, Volkswagen Group, Mercedes, etc. And that means that they're probably going to be losing about a tenth of their workforce because these electric cars, they're plug and play. They are just blocks of things you drop in there, not near as much uh know-how to put together compared to building an engine so they're going to lose some uh jobs out of this by going in electric so again that's what happened when they went away from horse and buggy to whips and stuff <laughs> well um, I, it was a little bit different there. But, that was a, that was a technical technological advance but but i kind of feel like okay hopefully people can take and jump over but that's a thing that you don't think about well isn't there no there's less moving pieces in electric cars I don't know if there's necessarily fewer moving parts. Well, the they're, motor. They're just different. It's just electric power. It's a, well, it's it's a not, turbine. It's not a magic you know, and they tesseract make, in there. There's actually something that makes it all work. Right, but the turbines are a lot less components compared to a uh, art and turbine. Uh, the motor, electric motor, has got a lot less components than a uh, piston uh, engine. So it'll be interesting to see how things shake out in the next 10, 20, 30 Forty years, I think. Well, I don't know if I want to go that far. I mean, I think I think twenty years is fine. You you have at that point, you, the knowledge is going to be solid for electric. Total, yeah, everybody I going so. that route. We'll see if it really does take off the way they think uh, it's yeah. going to be. So, stick with us. We got our really cool trivia question oh, yeah. coming next oh, yeah. on horsepower, chrome, and rust. Hang on till right after these messages. This is Vince LaViolette from Shelby American in Las Vegas, and you're listening to Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. Help us if you can. You're an El Camino, El Camino man. Only you can understand. Hey, 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 welcome back. This is Around the Wheel. This is where we talk about upcoming events and the weekly trivia question on Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. And as a matter of fact, we do have some upcoming events because, you know, it's February now, and we're actually at the beginning of car show season. Already? They're ha- it's, fr- it's frightening, but yeah. I mean, some parts of the country, obviously our show emanates uh, from the Pacific Northwest, so it's still kind of crummy weather-wise up here, but there have been uh, flash meets and other things that have gone on. And well, there yeah, are, yeah. There are, I mean, starting on the 8th and 9th of this month, there were car shows in, in some of the surrounding cities. So we do have a couple coming up that are going to be kind of fun. I'm going to tell you about a couple of them. The 29th of February, which is only a couple weeks away, the uh, INCCC night at the Drags in Spokane Valley, Spokane, Washington, is uh, is a fairly big show. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, and that's going to go on on the 29th. And in March, we got the 7th and 8th. It's the Salem Roadster Show in Salem, Oregon. Um, it's combined with the Moonshiners 4x4 swap meet. Wow. <laughs> so it's a big deal. And uh, and then they have a unique street and car culture show in Salem, the same day, 7th and 8th. And uh, Salem's not so far from the Pacific North. It's part of the Pacific Northwest. It is. But, uh, you know, if you're if you're from out of the area and you're looking for something fun, that's a that's a huge one. And on the other side of the country, on March 7th, the Bulletproof show makes its appearance in Florida and uh, in Ocala, Florida. And, uh, you know, Bulletproof makes a, it's a national tour. So they're all over the place, and uh, there's one up in the I Northwest would like to go too. there. Maybe they can bring us on. We'll be the MCs. Bulletproof is a lot of fun. It's a big deal. Yeah. Um, and, of course, there's, you know, locally there's there's some kind of meet happening just about every week here. And <laughs> we'll be talking about four. it as the time goes by. Yeah, it's, <laughs> there's something every different day. So uh, our trivia question last week was a good one, and we got a winner. It's very cool. The question was... When was the first car radio invented, and what car did it go in? And, you know, if you happen to know, well, so here's the deal. The first car radio was invented in 1929. Oh, wow. But Josh Ellsworth got with us on our Facebook page, and he said, well, ha, I got one better. Yes, the Galvin Manufacturing Company did invent the radio in 1929. However, they put it in a car in 1930, oh. and that's where the term Motorola was coined. No way. Yes. 
So Josh Ellsworth gets the coveted bucket Motorola. of barn find dust for wow. this particular week. And uh, Josh, thanks for getting to us on Facebook. It was very, very cool. And uh, and some extra information on that one that I didn't expect as well. So nice job. Is that like rock and roller? Rock Motorola. and roller, Motorola. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great. I love it. So, uh, so next week, next week, question for next week is a tough one. Rolls Royce. Everybody knows Rolls Royce. Can't beat it. And it is a, you know, an epic, iconic car, top-of-the-line car, yada, yada, yada. But there is some place in the world that has more Rolls Royces per capita than any place else. And you will know that. You will find that. You will Google that, probably. And Is, and is, is it related you to will, someplace hot? You will call up and ask Nathan Lipinski, and he will know. <laughs> is there some, is, is, am I getting close if I say it's someplace where it's hot? No. Oh. You're not. Oh. You think you I are. I think I did. But no, you're not. I have no, no idea then. So what place in the world has more Rolls Royces per capita oh, than any place else? If you know, you can get us an email at contact us at horsepowerchromeandrust.com. You can send us a Facebook page. You can get us a Facebook messenger. You can uh, send a smoke signal or just throw a rock at my house, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, and you too, yes, you too, could be the coveted winner of the Horsepower Chrome and Rust bucket of barn find dust, which, as we all know, if you pour on your vehicle, oh, will make it, it into does. a barn find car and quadruple the value. And you can be, be the, the the star of your own YouTube video, Barn Find. And there's another show coming to a town near you, and that <laughs> is the 2020 Hot Wheels Legends Tour. Oh, is yeah. hitting the road. Uh, the first one starts in March 7th. Right. It will be in Portland, not in Seattle this year. That's but right. uh, It's a good one. I've got last year's ready to roll cool. on our YouTube channel, which should be rolling within a week and a half. We will let you know. Hey, thanks for liking and following our website and our Facebook page. Thanks to Jerry Heasley for a great conversation about barn find cars and his YouTube channel this week. For Shane Osborne and Steve Johan, I'm Brady Wright saying keep your eyes on the road, your hands on the wheel, your foot to the floor, and your face next to the windshield. Next week, we trip the lights on another horsepower chrome and rust.